context for myself, my name is Lexi Vega, and I'm a Palestinian American, and also descend as a Christian Palestinian American. My grandparents are from Yaffa. On my dad's side, my mom spawns from a small village in Mahmoud, and they actually sought refuge in 1938 as they got kicked out of their homes and moved to Jordan. I'm a first generation American. Um, and just very proud of where I come from, but also that where I come from means that there's a lot of trauma, grief, and baggage, and that I feel um, both an obligation uh, and a duty to my homeland and my ancestors to not forget what happened and to continue to carry the conversations to ensure that within our lifetime, we can see a free Palestine. Um, I was invited here today to speak a little bit about Uncommitted and share with you all how that movement was birthed, why it was birthed, where we're going, what does it mean, and how it's helping to reshape the conversations that are happening around Palestine. But before I do that, I think it's really important to bring people into this space in an empathetic way. So if you're capable of doing so, if you're comfortable doing so, I'd love for you to close your eyes. And in fact, imagine your most favorite room in your home or your most favorite space in the world and picture yourself doing your most favorite thing in that moment. And as you picture that, I want you to imagine, you know, if you have a favorite person, I think we all do, imagine your most, you know, the person that you love the most in that space with you. And I want you to carry these thoughts out of this, this very safe, loving space and into a space where that place no longer exists and that person is taken from you and experience that emotion. And while some of you may be experiencing a very negative emotion right now, which is not my intention, I think it's important for us to, to center ourselves sometimes on the emotions and the empathy behind the experiences we have in this world that can allow us to feel mobilized to support people that we might not see as family or that we might not know or that are not our neighbors, but they are people. And for that very simple reason, we should always mobilize behind creating a society in which all people have the right to self-determination, all people have the right to freedom, and that all people are safe no matter where they are, no matter their identity, their background, their racial background, their ethnic background, their gender background. We should create a world in which all people are, feel safe and have this right to self-determination and freedom. And so I have been advocating uh, and organizing for Palestine for a very long time. I came to MSU from 2010 to 2014. I was the president of the Arab Cultural Society on campus. And through my work uh, as the president of the Arab Cultural Society, I worked really hard to build bridges between student groups on campus. And my first experience, I, I grew up in Dearborn and Growing up in Dearborn, I, I've always felt really safe. For those that know Dearborn, it's most, one of the most densely populated cities with Arab Americans outside the Middle East. And even though I was Christian, I grew up with mostly Muslim best friends. Um, I never felt different. It was, we were very rooted in our culture and it felt like such a safe place. And knowing uh, that I'm Palestinian and, and some of my, my history, I didn't really understand the depths of the oppression and the um, you know, this is the, the systemic oppression that exists both here in America and back in, in Palestine and Israel and how it impacted many people. But through my work with ACS, I actually, uh, I had gone for the first time ever to the Hillel House on campus. And I walked through the doors for the first time and a big poster sat on the door that said, have you experienced your birthright trip yet? And I've never heard of birthright. And so I had went home that day and I asked myself, what is birthright? And through my learnings, I discovered that a birthright trip is that for any Jewish American, whether you were born in Israel or not, you have this right to a birthright to go back to Israel and visit this homeland that is supposed to belong to you. And from my context and knowledge of how my grandparents experienced, they had no right to return to a land that was theirs. And so it created this, this really clear demarcation in my mind of what it meant to be Palestinian in America and what it meant to be Palestinian back home. And that I had to begin organizing both in honor of my ancestry and what I wanted for myself in the future to be able to step on Palestinian land that is free. For my grandparents, for my parents, for my father, for my mother, and my activism began. And I say all that to say in my learnings, you know, I, I believe activism happens in waves. In wave one, you sound the alarm to let people know an injustice 
which we've been doing for so long. And wave two, you once people are aware that there's an injustice happening, how can we provide them with clear education to understand how they can digest what is happening and make very clear decisions in their own minds about how they want to show up in that space. And that's what we've been doing is educating folks. That's why we're here today. And then I think wave three is activating collective power. And we're in a particularly interesting year with elections, for those that don't know, where not only obviously are we re-electing a new president or a president, but we are also re-electing 435 House seats and, um, what is that, 100 and, or I just lost the number. All House seats and Senate seats are, are 33, it's 435 House seats and 33 Senate seats that are up for re-election. And what you're seeing or what we've seen, you know, after uh, Senator just gave a really, really beautiful history of what has happened is I, I deeply believe that there is a cancer that exists within our society and that what Palestine has done is it has revealed that cancer. And what's unfortunate is that our elected officials, rather than curing that cancer, they're continuing to inject the virus that is making it worse. And what the uncommitted movement is doing is it's actually providing a cure to that cancer. And I'll explain a little bit how. So we actually had a, a, a several democratic strategists who came together and we discussed how we have been trying to create change for so long in our society when it comes to Palestine. We have been protesting, we have been shutting down bridges, we have been shutting down highways, we've been going to our elected officials' homes, we've been emailing, we've been phone calling, we've been doing everything we could, and our pleas have fallen on deaf ears. Where you have 80% of Democrats that are demanding an immediate and permanent ceasefire, and only 4% of our Congress has responded. And even most recently, where you have more elected officials that are signing on to an aid deal or a, a House resolution to send more aid to Israel amidst them currently just, just decimating more homes, more lives, killing seven World Central Aid kitchen workers, showing that what we have done is we have fed a beast called Israel for so long that they are acting in an uncontrollable way that we can no longer even control their actions. And that's a scary place to be in. And so what we did is we said, what could we do? We've done everything, we feel like we've done everything we could. What could we do to get the attention of our elected officials? And as you all know, votes is where it hurts. Votes is where they'll start to pay attention. Votes is where they'll need our money. Votes is where they're gonna want to sit down and have conversations with us. And so what we decided is rather than having them control the narrative around how they're gonna engage with our communities, because elected officials and, and you know being an elected seat is not supposed to be a lifelong career, it's a mission. You serve in office as a mission to create a better society for people that you are serving. We decided that we were going to control the narrative. And so we were presented with this idea in the primaries where obviously you're not actually electing any president in that moment, but it's a trajectory of what the, the numbers look like and how certain presidents are polling amongst different communities. And so what we did is we decided to, instead of voting for Joe Biden, who's currently aiding and abetting in the Palestinian genocide, we are going to vote uncommitted. Because we know what a threat Trump is to our society, but that does not mean that we cannot hold, or that we, we shouldn't hold Biden accountable for the atro atrocious decisions that he's making as well. And so what we did in Michigan, for those that I think most folks know, but if not, Michigan's actually the first state that held a primary for selection season on February 27th. And with Michigan being the most predominantly dense, or one of the most predominantly dense Arab American, Muslim American communities uh, across the country, it was a prime opportunity to really control the narrative around how our communities are feeling and what it is that we demand from our administration. And so we got a small team together in literally less than three weeks with a very, very shoestring budget. Very shoestring, when I tell you, like, if you guys think like a thin shoestring, like think of that thin shoestring. <laughs> And we organized. And you know, what I'm saying is, you know, I, I think it was wildly successful. We ended up with 101,000, over 101,000 plus uncommitted votes. 73 out of 83, so a lot of folks don't know this number, 73 out of 83 counties across Michigan voted at least 10% uncommitted, which is huge. If you think about numbers, that is huge. We landed two delegates, one in District 12 and one in District 6, that we will get to organize to go to the, the national convention. And then on top of that, one of our data pieces is when we did phone banking and text banking, some of the data that we were able to pull back 
is that our movement actually turned out 42% of unlikely and not likely voters to the polls. Wow. And what we learned from this, this movement is that our administration has created a key block of voters to become incredibly disillusioned with our political system because of how they have chosen to ignore the demands of the people, which are our basic demands of calling for an immediate permanent ceasefire and the release of all hostages because it saves lives on both sides and that we uh, embargo uh, 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 munition and cut military aid to Israel because they have violated so many war crimes. And how can we, it, it, it's a violation of our own laws to continue to aid and abet in, 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 when war crimes, war crimes are being executed. And so we are simply asking elected officials to actually act in line with the very rules that they created. And so the fact that we have turned out these, these key data points showcases that we were able to mobilize, you know, rather than people feeling angry and frustrated and disengaged from their right to vote, we actually have increased the, the, the number of people that are engaging in our political process and political system to become more of advocates. And we believe that we, you get what you organize for. And we were prepared to organize very damn well for a very, very, uh, very, very good reason. And so the next morning, if y'all follow the story, it literally hit headlines everywhere. Like it wasn't even just in Michigan, it wasn't even just in the United States, it was globally. It hit headlines around uncommitted and the impact that it had and the waves that it shook and how it actually shook Biden and his administration. And then there was the State of the Union and there was no comment about the uncommitted vote, which further enraged people around how our administration continues to align with the right-wing fascist government rather than their own people here in America. And so what we started to see was a lot of other states felt really inspired by the movement and they wanted to be able to engage in a political process where they felt like they weren't betraying their own values, but also they're very concerned about Trump. What do we do? People don't know what they're gonna do. When you are literally proposed with Biden as an option and Trump as an option, and we're tired of this concept of how do we not no longer vote for the lesser of two evils where I have to have countless arguments with folks of you cannot weaponize Trump against my own people's death. You cannot weaponize the fear of Trump against my own people being murdered. And that I will choose to be courageous and stand in this specific moment and demand more of my elected, uh, uh, elected leader. That I will continue to fight and demand more of my elected leader because we deserve better in this society. And so conversations started happening, uh, you know, particularly in the, in the White House, where we're like, it's okay, we'll work around Michigan. Well, then Washington happened, where Washington State got 80, over 89,000 votes and also won two delegates, which by the way, delegates was never in our, in our picture. It was just simply to showcase to Biden that there are key, a key block of voters that are telling you to change course on Gaza, and if you don't, we're going to hand this presidency over to Trump. Washington happened. And then Minnesota happened, where they got 11 delegates, over 45,000 uncommitted votes. And then um, our little friends in Hawaii, by the way, I don't know if anybody knows this, they actually did not even organize. They had maybe three days of organizing a few people. They got 29% of their uncommitted votes and seven delegates in Hawaii, right? That was unheard of. And then there was Missouri, who uh, ended up getting three delegates. And then there was the key battleground state of Wisconsin. So Wisconsin is, it, for those that don't know, typically swings blue, but it also could swing red if they wanted. And in 2020, Biden won the election by 20,652 votes, a very, very small margin. When they launched their uncommitted a, a couple weeks ago, where the ground organizers listened to Wisconsin, they ended up getting 48,952 votes. And it sent a resounding, alarming message to Biden and the White House that you are going to lose this election if you don't change course. And so the purpose of the movement is to ultimately put pressure to adjust the policies that we're seeing when it comes to foreign policies, particularly in the Middle East, because our region has been decimated by senseless wars being led out by American or US funded bombs, uh, particularly with Israel and Palestine for far too long. And this is not just an Arab and Muslim issue. What we saw in our movement is a multiracial, multi-faith, multi-ethnic, multi-generational uh, um, organization where, you know, the three people leading it, myself, Leila Abed, and Abbas Alawiya, Abbas is a Lebanese um, American. He actually grew up in Lebanon and uh, his life was almost taken by a US-funded Israeli crowd. 
a, a bomb dropped right near his home. And he said that, you know, when he shares his story, he talks a lot about how he could still smell and hear the bomb and how that, that, that experience lives with him for the rest of his life, that trauma that lives with him for the rest of his life. There's Leila Abed, who's a Palestinian American. She's Muslim. And then there's myself, who's Palestinian American, and I'm Christian. And so this just diversity in the movement where there's Black Americans, Jewish Americans, Hispanic Americans, young voters, older voters, union workers, teachers, social workers, just people of so many different backgrounds that are getting behind this because we are tired of seeing a two-party system, particularly Democrats that say, well, we're not Republican, so we're better. We can't settle for that anymore. And what this movement is doing is it's aiming to create a better uh, party, particularly for the Democratic Party, to say that we no longer want senseless wars. That this is not a messaging problem, it's a bombs problem. And that we need to change course and we need to change course right now. And it also insulates and protects us because what we hear all the time, I myself as an Arab American and a Palestinian American, by showing the, the messages I get on, on social media, love messages, but also hate messages of, oh, you're a Hamas lover. Oh, you're handing this presidency over to Trump. Oh, you should go to, to back to Palestine and you should get murdered. Or we can't wait for them to nuke Gaza. We can't wait for them to get rid of all the Palestinians. And my job is to, to see past and to continue moving because I want to build a society and I have been raised to believe deeply that I have a responsibility as a human to create a world in which I see each of you and each of you sees me, and it's not just the, the face card of me, but the true depths of me, where we create a world in which we see and understand each other and, and create a world in which we each love each other. And it's going to take courage. And again, what the movement has done is it's now no longer a movement where I stand alone or Leila stands alone or Elisa stands alone or Silas stands. It's a movement where people are actually standing together. And you know, APAC can have all the money in the world, but money cannot out-organize people. We have the power. When we go to the ballot box and we vote, we have to remember that we have the power. And what the movement reminds people is that when we go to the ballot box, we are not waiting for an elected official to come to us and tell us what they're going to give us. We are going to our elected officials and demanding what we want to see with them to serve their constituents, to serve people and to ensure that they are acting in alignment with our values of equity, justice, peace, liberty for all people, and not just some people. And so to wrap this up, our next phase of the movement, we just closed out on Wisconsin, the next phase of the movement, now that we've got delegates, which was never planned, is the, the convention. And, and you know, going to the convention with our anti-war pro-peace narrative and our pro-Palestinian narrative that we want to begin rebalancing the relationship between the United States and Palestine and Israel, and that we want to demand our government starts to engage in a peace process where Palestinian kids experience the rights to self-determination and freedom. But more importantly, that we start to demand that we no longer sense endless wars and really create a society here in which all people have the right to self-determination and freedom. When we can send billions of our tax dollars to Israel, whose people get to experience free secondary education and get to experience free healthcare, well, I have a $200,000 debt looming over my head and my tax dollars go to fund the murdering of my people. Do you know the psychological like acrobats that does inside of a person's head? You have to think about that. So not only are they killing people overseas, but they're murdering us slowly here because of the psychological warfare that we have to be exposed to every single day. And so I really urge folks to you know, engage in the process, stay close to uncommitted. We're headed to the convention next where we're going to be gathering our delegates under this anti-war pro-peace narrative to continue to push that on the DNC floor, to, to push resolutions and policies and conversations around how can we reshape the Democratic Party? Because when, if Biden gets reelected, when he resigns in 2028, he gets to walk away and go to his vacation and enjoy his life. And it's the Democratic Party that's going to have to clean up its mess. And if we can afford to clean up a mess for the next 10 years, then keep making the choices you're making. But I can tell you right now, it's not something this country can afford. And so I advise us to ensure that if we want to protect our democracy, if we want to protect our country, if we want to protect our rights, and also protect rights of humans across, you know, overseas, then we have to engage in these processes. We have to stay close to them. Um, you can go to the uncommittedmovement.com to follow what we're doing. 
If you're capable of donating to support the next phases of our movements, please do so. If you want to volunteer in the next phases of our movements, you can sign up online. But it's a really important movement that has shifted the conversations that are happening and has brought so many different people together, which I think is really important right now. Thank you.